that one more time. He is risen. He is risen yes, let's be excited about that. Let's try to carry that on. We need to carry that on, not just for last week. Last week was a wonderful, wonderful celebration, but we need to continue to carry that on 365 days a year. It's not just about that one day, so I hope that you can do that. Um, Pastor Dave is going to just do a little announcement here before I finish through with announcements. It was a great Sunday uh, last week. We had a lot of people uh, here last Sunday, which was awesome. Some people that we haven't seen in a long time were able to uh, come and visit with us. But something that I noted is it's like everybody seemed to be piled up in the back, okay? And I'm not sure why that is. I do shower uh, beforehand, so you really can come forward. Um, but uh, more seriously, for those who um, have those concerns for social distancing, this was their first time back. And for some of them, they felt kind of closed in. So as you sit, uh, as people come, be respectful. You know, make sure before you swoop in and give them a hug because that's what you want to do. Be respectful about that because uh, for some people with their uh, underlying health conditions, they still would love to keep that social distance. So just a reminder for you folks for, for that. Thanks. Thank you, Pastor Dave. Those are good things for us to remember. I know we're all getting excited. People are getting vaccinated, so we just still need to kind of remember to take it easy, be a little careful here yet until we're more in the clear. So that's a great reminder. Fellowship Coffee is starting today. There is coffee made down in the Fellowship Hall. 
we encourage you to go down, get a cup of coffee. There are plenty of tables set up, and there is plenty of room to social distance down in the fellowship hall. So um, we're looking forward to getting that started again. Wednesday night programs are going to start up this week. So um, cadets and gems and kingdom kids, all of that will be starting again. So we look forward to those programs. And then um, I just wanted to highlight Bible school. Kim and I have set dates for Bible school. They are in your bulletin. Um, we really, I guess let me back up. I have put notes in people's boxes that have helped in the past. If you are new and you have not helped in the past and you would like to help in the past, or like to help in the past, help this year. <laughs> I love this. I didn't, yeah, whatever. Um, please let Kim or I know. We'll be glad to, to just let us know you're willing to help and then we can go from there. So it really depends on the number of volunteers that we have this year as to whether we're going to go forward with Bible school. So that's just um, something that we needed to look at. So just read your bulletin. There's lots of things in your bulletin. Um, Kara takes a lot of time to put um, concerns and prayer concerns and everything in the bulletin. So please take time to read your bulletin. Um, would you please rise? All right. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 57. Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 57. Take my place That you would bear 
with me you're standing in the presence of royalty of not just an earthly king but the king of kings the Lord and creator of all the earth is with us this morning 
here today stand in awe. We bow in reverence and we worship for who he is, but also recognize him for all that he has done for us. Jesus Christ loves you. He gave his life for you. He welcomes you to himself and he says to you, may grace, mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Amen. Boys and girls, you guys want to come up this morning for children's message? Who would like to come? I need somebody who's really strong. Are you strong? Yeah? You think you can hold this? Is that too heavy? You just hold on to that, okay? Do you like one too, Nolan? I only brought two. That's about all I can lift at home. You gonna hang on to that? Is it getting heavy? See if you can hold it. Just, just hold it. Don't set it on your lap. Mm, starting to get heavy, isn't it? No, you're doing fine, huh? Uh huh. Go like this once a few times. Whoa, you are strong. Uh huh. What do you think? Do you think you'd like to carry that around all day long? Not really, huh? It's okay for right now, but it gets heavy, doesn't it? Boy, it would be nice not to have to carry weight around with you, especially if you want to run and play. Oh, that thing is getting heavy. You ready to give it back? Not yet? How about you? Hang on to it. You want to hold on to it for a while? Sure. Ooh, that's kind of heavy, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Now, Nolan here, he says, I don't want to carry that thing. That's, that's too heavy. And you know what? Sin is kind of like that. The more we sin, the heavier it gets. The more it weighs us down and makes us feel uncomfortable gets in the way of things. That's called guilt. Feeling guilty on the inside because you know you've done bad things. <sighs> Wouldn't it be great to get rid of guilt? Get rid of all the bad things? Let's pretend you give it back to me. Give back that guilt. And I'll pretend that I'm Jesus and I take all of your guilt from not only you, but everybody else. Suppose everybody in the whole world is carrying this guilt. And Jesus says, I will take it all. That's a lot of weight, isn't it? That's a lot of guilt. But that's what Jesus has done for us. When he died on the cross, he paid for all of our sins and he took the weight of our guilt on himself. So we don't have to carry it anymore. Let's stand up. Let's jump up and down. Let's dance. We don't have that guilt anymore. That's exciting. You don't like dancing? Oh, man, rats. Well, you don't have to carry your guilt because when we confess our sins to Jesus, he promises to take it all away. Okay? All right. Thanks so much. You guys can head to your classes. That resurrection living is living in joy, living in peace, living in bounty of God's blessings, whether that's material prosperity or whether that just comes in that faith and that assurance. But the Lord calls us to give to give of our skills and abilities, like Bible school that Carrie was mentioning, to give of our time and efforts, but also to give of our material resources, that his work can go forward, that more and more people will hear and know and embrace the good news. And 
Karen Smith is going to lead us in a prayer of thanks. Let us come before the Lord in humility and in love and in worship. Father God, thank you so much for what you've given to us in life, in living, in resources. Help us to give back. Help us to be discerning. Help us to be cooperative and help us to love in making decisions to honor you through the gifts that you give to us. Bless them, Father, for your glory and your honor. And we thank you so much in the name of Jesus. Amen. And join us for your love, O oh Lord. And please, as you rise and as you sing, sing this to the Lord, especially after all the all the blessings that he gives us each and every day. as we are picturing those everlasting arms of yours which reach to the heavens which stretch to the skies which were laid out on a bare wooden cross and nailed to it for us 
for our salvation, for our forgiveness, to take away our guilt. Lord, we see those arms now, nail-scarred, but embracing, wrapping around us now, holding us close, speaking words of comfort and grace and assurance. Lord, as we open your word this morning, speak to our hearts and lives with truth and power and grace. In your name we pray. Amen. I've invited Chuck and Ellen Osterday to be our readers for today. They'll be reading from the Gospel of John, the last chapter. Chapter 21, John 21, verses 1 through 19. This is a post-resurrection appearance of Jesus. And um, just a lot of interesting dynamics there, which will help us grow in God's Word today. So, check it out. John 21, 1 through 19. It is a longer passage. If you care to stand, you know, you're welcome to do that, but understanding it is a little longer, so. We welcome you to stand in God's presence. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not recognize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals, and there were fish on it, and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me.
if Jesus is alive? And that's not a question in my mind, but that's just a, a first statement, a proposition. If this is true, which I firmly believe it is true, and if you wrestle with that, it's not like we can prove it to you, but there are many historical facts and documents which certainly lend credibility to that truth, as well as a couple of billion people who will confess that he lives and reigns in our hearts today. But if Jesus is alive, then following from that, if that is true, which I believe it is, then this follows my failures can be forgiven. Let that sink in this morning. Let that truth grab hold of you. If I believe that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, then what he accomplished on the cross is true. It's a fact and can be applied to my life. My failures can be forgiven. Who's got failures? <laughs> that we do. It wasn't planned. But neither was it planned to be prevented. It happened so quickly, so deliciously, following one's heart right into Satan's snare. It was the 25-year high school reunion at a nice downtown hotel. Dinner, drinks, dancing, lots of memories, lots of unfulfilled longings. His wife had a business trip that she had to go to, but she said it was fine if he wanted to go. She doesn't know anybody there anyway. It'd be pretty boring. He was eager to reconnect Reconnect with old friends, male and female, and there she was. Yeah, the high school sweetheart, heartthrob, the one everybody wanted to date. She ended up marrying the captain of the football team. He was now a successful car dealer. But a couple years ago, he traded her in on a newer model. And now she was single. And they were both there alone. Why? It made sense to sit together. Why not? Why not buy her a drink? And when the band started playing, and everybody was having fun dancing, well, certainly they could enjoy that too as friends. But he had never planned for where his heart was taking him, but neither had he planned not to go there as well, and he did. Moral failure, it comes in all shapes and sizes, deliberate or subconsciously allowed, but still failure still devastating, still a wreckage that is created and an irre erasable impact in one's life. What's your story? It may not be a 25-year high school reunion, but we all have our stories where judgment slipped badly, where preventative measures were not taken, where boundaries were not observed, where one's heart led one to a place of self-gratification rather than keeping God's word. And we live with guilt. We live with regret. 
we live with a sense of shame. And it's a heavy burden to carry. Peter has a story like that. Yeah, Peter, the apostle. Peter, the, the early leader in the church. His backstory isn't all pretty either. Yeah, he was a fisherman. One day Jesus came to the lake shore asked them to set out a little bit and, hey, put your nets in. They had just had a frustrating night of catching nothing, and now this preacher guy thinks he knows better than them on the time of day to catch fish. It wasn't the better time, but he thinks it's going to happen. And a miraculously amazing large number of fish were caught. That was early. That was the first introduction. And Peter stood there in front of Jesus and said, Lord, I am a sinful man because he immediately recognized this was no ordinary catch of fish. This was the work of God through this man's life. And Peter felt his guilt. Peter felt his shame. Peter was one who was first to speak. And boy, there at Caesarea Philippi, he had the right answer. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Good job, Peter. You got it right. But that same mouth also got him into trouble as they headed towards Jerusalem on that night before Jesus was arrested. Peter pledging his allegiance, I will give my life for you, Lord. He probably meant it. He was probably sincere in his intentions. But when the reality played out, the truth was he denied his Lord three times. And a rooster crowed. And the gaze of Jesus over at Peter made him cower in shame and be crushed in guilt. Peter's story has in it his share of failures as well. And now the news was Jesus rose from the dead. Peter had not yet seen him. And he gets to this place of frustration. He gets to this place where if, if if life is done for me in terms of what it was in connection to Jesus, then I just need to go back to what I know, what I do best, go back to fishing. He grabbed a couple of friends and just said, let's go fishing. And guess what? That turned out to be frustrating as well. Chuck and Ellen read. Afterwards, Jesus appeared to his disciples at the Sea of Galilee happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana, sons of Zebedee, two other disciples there together. And who says it? Peter. I'm going out to fish. We'll go with you, they said. But that night they caught nothing. The failures in their life with Jesus Christ now are manifest in their inability even to do something that they knew so well. And it was frustrating for them. But now a voice calls out in that misty darkness as the light was just starting to appear over the hills around the Sea of Galilee. Jesus calls out to them, his friends, friends, there's a term of familiarity. Friends, haven't you any fish? Now, that sounds to us like a simple question. Hey, did you catch anything? But the structure in the Greek language of that question indicates that the one who is asking the question already knows the answer. In English, we would put it like, didn't catch anything, did you? Smart Alec. Who needs his advice? 
We just worked hard all evening in this Guy on the shore, friends, <laughs> didn't catch anything, did you? <sighs> no, we didn't. But then, what does he say? They answered no. He says, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. Those who understand fishing techniques on the Sea of Galilee know that one of the techniques is, is that you set out a net kind of in a half circle around the shore. And as you bring that net in, whatever fish are there are kind of caught between the net and the shore and you wrap them up. But now Jesus is saying throw the net on the opposite side of where the fish are supposed to be caught. Doesn't know anything about fishing, obviously. But then, neither did that guy three years earlier who said, let's go out fishing in the middle of the afternoon. And so already Jesus is replaying that original call to ministry. Jesus is setting up the situations to remind the disciples of those earlier days when he invited them not to be fishers of fish, but fishers of men. And sure enough, what happens when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's got to be the Lord. It's got to be. All of these little coincidences triggered his memory and said, Peter, for sure, that is Jesus. Now for Peter, he's got a choice to make. Remember, he's still living in guilt and shame from that denial. He's still living with the weight of what he did to his Lord. Would he run away? Or would he draw close once again? And Peter, as soon as he heard John say, it is the Lord, wraps the outer garment around him because he had taken it off, jumps in the water and swims to Jesus. It's really quite an undignified approach. But at that point, Peter didn't care. He wasn't too worried at that point what others thought of him. And then the only thing that mattered to him is what Jesus thought of him. And he felt the invitation once again. The recall to come to the Savior and bow before him. He jumps into the water and swims there. This realization takes place in Peter's heart and in his mind. Maybe I'm not a lost case after all. Maybe I'm, I, there is some hope. Jesus promised forgiveness. Maybe that might be true for me as well. And he gets to shore. And they land there, and they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. And again, in this description by the Apostle John, there's just so many little clues that are happening there. First of all, burning coals. John makes it a point, doesn't say there's a campfire on the beach. He says, no, there is a fire of burning coals. The word is used very rarely in the New Testament, but the last time it was used was just three chapters earlier, John 18, when Peter was in the courtyard and it was cold and the servants and the officials stir, stood around a charcoal fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing there with them, warming himself and what happened next? Yeah. That was the time that he denied knowing Jesus three times. 
And so again, in the description of the details, the Apostle John is bringing us back to that courtyard, pre-crucifixion, pre-resurrection, or after Peter had said, I will give my life for you. And then when push came to shove and the pressure was on, he even denied knowing who Jesus was. Not just once, not twice, but three times before that rooster crowed. There's another interesting connection as well. Back to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs of all places. Wisdom literature. As Solomon gives wisdom on how to live life and relationships with others. He says, if your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. And it just seems to go against just the, our opposite inclination, right? Our enemy, why would we want to feed our enemy? Why would we want to give them something to drink? Solomon says in Proverbs, because in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. That sense of shame or realization that though I've done evil, though I've done bad things to someone else, though I've been untrue, they still are faithful, they still are loving and caring to me, and the Lord will reward you, it says in Proverbs. And so Jesus has a fire a burning coals and he wants them to bring some fish. And he's got some bread because he's going to serve Peter and the others some breakfast. Remember, if your enemy is hungry, give him something to eat. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Jesus came and he took the bread and he gave it to them. And he did the same with the what word comes next? Fish. Okay, good. You remember the text. But, but play that sentence through your head just a few times. Jesus came. He took the bread. He gave thanks. He gave it to them and said, This is my body, which is given for you. This is my blood, which is given for you. Now, here it's fish. Yep fish and bread. But again, the language echoes what happened just a week or so or less earlier. As they gathered around the table of the Passover, as Jesus took the elements there, he transformed the Passover into the Lord's Supper as a constant reminder for the forgiveness of sins. And here now on the shore, with bread and fish, Jesus is replaying that Passover meal, the Lord's Supper, for his disciples. Because Jesus is pushing towards reconciliation. Reconciliation bringing two who have been estranged from one another, separated from one another, a wall built up between because of sin, because of shame, because of guilt. Reconciliation brings back together and deals honestly with the problem. With the faults, it doesn't just sweep it under the rug. It just says, doesn't say no big deal. It names the elephant in the room. It names what happened and what took place. But yet you work through it and say, I am no longer holding this against you. As far as I'm concerned, it is done. It is, it is finished. It is completed. I will no longer operate as in the way as if you had hurt me. Reconciliation deals honestly with what happened, but moves courageously forward in absorbing the hurt, the cost 
of that break in the relationship, the offended party says, I will no longer be offended by you because my love for you is stronger than what you did to me. So when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Peter hears that question, and he knows where it's going. He knows what we're talking about. But it is hard for him. <laughs> Can you imagine? Hard for Peter to speak. But he has been chastened. He has been humbled. He knows his failure. He replies, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. But it's a week. Because it's hard for him to express his love when he still feels the weight of guilt. But Jesus says to him, feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. Be a shepherd, Peter. I've called you out of fishing into being a shepherd of people. Peter, feed my lambs. And again, Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And again, Peter, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. It's a call, a recall, an invitation. For each statement of denial, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And each time it's hard for Peter, yes, Lord, I I do, but I feel like such a failure. I feel like I've let you down so much. I don't know if you ever want me back. And Jesus says, I do. Feed my lambs. Take care of my sheep. And then the third time he says to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter, yeah, he's hurt. But it's the kind of hurt that happens in surgery when the abscess needs to be removed, when the cancer needs to be taken care of, when what is broken needs to be mended and put back together again. It's that kind of hurt which leads to healing. I was hurt because he asked him a third time, do you love me? But then he said, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. Feed my sheep, Peter. If you were having breakfast with Jesus, and in whatever way he would raise to the level of consciousness, whatever failure it was that you identified earlier, what would Jesus be saying to you? If your fear is as that all you would hear is his condemnation and wrath, then you've not heard the gospel yet. The gospel is, is that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Yes, sin angers God. Yes, sin is an affront to God. It separates, it destroys, it creates havoc and wreckage. But love is stronger. Love won the victory over the grave. And Jesus is saying to you this morning, whatever your name is, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? 
Not are you going to be perfect and straighten up and be a good kid from here on in. No. Do you love me? Do you want to be in relationship with me? Do you want your sins forgiven? And do you want me to enter into your life again to help you walk that road of discipleship? It's hard. And if it were simply up to me, I would fail. But again and again and again, Jesus calls and says, Dave, come, come. Do you love me? Do you trust me? Do you believe in me? Will you allow me to help you walk with me once again? Now, for Peter, it wasn't going to be an easy road. Living the Christian life is, is not a breeze. There are still temptations, and there are still trials, and there are still frustrations, and there are things that happen which, which, ah. But when we walk close to the Lord, when we follow Him, when we allow His Spirit and His Word to do its work in us, He guarantees we will succeed that through his grace and forgiveness, he will call us home. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Peter went through pain. Peter went through suffering. Tradition has it that he too was crucified by the Romans. But he did it in love to his Lord. What began as a sincere but hollow promise before Christ's crucifixion, Peter, by God's grace and the help of the Holy Spirit, later fulfilled in his life. Because he just simply focused on following the Savior and allowing his work to flow through him as he fed his sheep and took care of his lambs. And Jesus says to him again, follow me. Follow me, Peter. That call that had come three years earlier now gets a recall. Peter, follow me. Let my grace have its effect, have its power in your life. Let the truth of my resurrection resonate in your life. You don't need to carry guilt. You don't need to carry shame. You don't need to be weighed down by whatever failures you have committed in the past. They are gone forever, covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And it's for you and for me. And just so you never forget, we have a meal that we use regularly, given by Jesus, where we take bread and drink juice and remember and believe that the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was given for a complete forgiveness of all of our sins. Will you follow Jesus? Will you trust him? How important do you think it was for Peter to hear Jesus call him to follow him once again? Oh, it was life restoring. It was invigorating. It was removing that weight of guilt and enabling him to live in the truth of the resurrection and the joy of the eternal kingdom. And how important is it for you to hear Jesus call you to follow him once again?
again. It will change everything. Nelson Mandela. Someone who was a political prisoner for over 25 years. Because he spoke out against the injustices of the white minority, but who held power in South Africa. There was a system, a political system called apartheid, which means there's two sets of rules, one for the white powerful minority and one for the black uh, majority who holds no power. And privilege would always come to that small minority. But then through political and international pressure, Nelson Mandela was freed from prison and free, fair elections were instituted. And in 1994, Nelson Mandela became the first black president of South Africa. And those who had held all the power for so long, who were used to the life of privilege, now realized their lives could become extremely miserable if the blacks began to treat them in the same way that they, the whites, had treated the black majority. And so there was a lot of fear and a lot of concern. What's going to happen next now that a black is in control. The movie Invictus captures that time in South Africa's history. And as Nelson Mandela began to chart a course forward for the whole nation, black and white, there was an incident early on as he was assembling his security guard detail. And we pick up the movie at that time. So now, when you get a chance, uh, can we get the schedule for the month? Yeah. We need to plan security. Officer of the President, good morning. Yes, sir. We'll do. We'll have that ready for you. We need more men. Did you talk to Brenda about it? Yes, yesterday. Ah, that must be Jesse with the schedule. Come in, beautiful. What's this? Mr. Jason Chabalolo. That's me. Am I under arrest? Captain Fader and team reporting for duty, sir. What duty? With a presidential bodyguard. We've been assigned to this office. Here are our orders. The special branch, right? You'll see that they've been signed. Well, okay, if they are signed. Just wait here. So just tell you, sir. You look agitated, Jason. Well, that's because there are four special branch cops in my office. Oh, what did you do? Nothing. Well, they say they're the presidential bodyguards and they have orders signed by you. Ah, yes, ah, yes. Well, uh, these men are special trained by SAS. They have lots of experience. They protected the clerk. Yes, sir, but it doesn't mean that they have to come. You asked for more men, didn't you? Yes, sir. I asked uh, When people see me in public, they see my bodyguards. You represent me directly. The Rainbow Nation starts here. Reconciliation starts here. Reconciliation, sir. Yes, reconciliation, Jason. Comrade President, not long ago, these guys tried to kill us. Maybe even these four guys in my office tried and often succeeded. Yes, I know. Forgiveness starts here, too. Forgiveness liberates the soul. 
It removes fear. That is why it is such a powerful weapon. Please, Jason. Try. Sorry to disturb you, sir. The head of security recognizes the four white men who enter. The special agents from the previous administration, people who often inflicted great harm and suffering. And it makes no sense to him why they are now being assigned to President Mandela's security detail. But Nelson Mandela knew that unless a new way is formed, a totally radical transformation where hate is replaced with love, where fear is replaced with trust, South Africa would never go forward, would never survive, but would disintegrate. Friends, we are members of a new kingdom, a new reality brought about by Jesus Christ. His gospel, his truth transforms. It makes forgiveness of my failures possible and then in following him enables me to live in reconciliation with others as well. The heart of the Bible says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Both are hard. But when we follow Jesus, everything becomes possible. Would you join me in prayer? Lord Jesus, we so want to walk in our own path, but you call us to follow you. We want to do things that make sense to us or are pleasing to us, but you will call us to lay down all of those things and to walk with you. Thank you for the forgiveness which you extend to us through your resurrection. And now we pray, Lord, that we live in its truth. We live in its light. We live in this new kingdom of love, grace, and reconciliation. In your name we pray. Amen. Would you please rise and join us for I Will Follow.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn the light of his face toward you and give to you his peace. wonderful week. Don't forget coffee's waiting for you if you want to go down to the fellowship hall.